Moving into part two of the program, uh, Glaucoma Diagnostics 2020 and Beyond. And I can't think of a better person to start this part of the program than our distinguished keynote speaker, Dr. Balwantri Chowhan. Dr. Chowhan is a Mathers Professor and Research Director of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences, Professor of Physiology and Biophysics, and Professor of Medical Neurosciences at Dalhousie University. He obtained his PhD at the University of Cardiff, Wales, and his postdoctoral training at UBC under Dr. Stephen Drance. And Dr. Challen's research is clinical and experimental glaucoma. In both research areas, there's an emphasis on imaging and assessing function. Dr. Chowan has received numerous awards and recognitions, including the Senior Alcon Research Institute Award, the Gold Fellow of the Association for Research in Vision and Ophthalmology, and the Secretariat Award of the American Academy of Ophthalmology. He is also president of the Glaucoma Research Society. Um, I'll run behind schedule if I uh, go on any more about all of his achievements. And the title of his keynote address today is Glaucoma Diagnostics, Perimetry or Imaging or Both. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Lisa, thank you very much for, for that uh, kind introduction. It's a, a really bizarre sensation to have to do this type of thing uh, uh, from my study. I, I've been wedded to this chair for three and a half months now. But uh, anyway, uh, here goes. Well, thank you very much. I want to focus really uh, on this very important question on glaucoma diagnostics. Do we need perimetry or imaging or both? And I'm going to focus my talk really on progression. Uh, because I really don't have time to cover all aspects um, of diagnostics. So I'll, I will focus on imaging uh, and perimetry for progression. Here are my disclosures. Uh, uh, I've been fortunate enough to receive uh, support from the Dalhousie Medical Research Foundation and the CIHR for numerous years. And a lot, a lot of this research that I'm going to cover um, has been covered by them. I also have some commercial sponsorships, which are primarily equipment grants uh, from those companies. This is a perennial question. My mentor, Stephen Drance, wrote a paper 46 years ago, or whatever it is. Uh, and this uh, discussion happened even in the 70s. Uh, you know, what should we use, uh, you know, the visual field or should we use the structural measurement? And the reality is that this question, I don't think is going to go away. Uh, we've made a lot of progress in the way that we structurally um, evaluate the eye. And as you can see, over the last um, 40 or 40 years or so, or 50 years or so, we have this uh, tremendous development in the imaging technology that's available to us. And this is just going to keep getting better and better. Uh, for perimetry, essentially, um, we have perimetry and automated perimetry is a stable tech technology. It's been with us for uh, you know, almost 40 years now. Uh, but the problem is that you, it, this is only technology. Uh, the biology or the question that we really want doesn't change. Uh, we can play around as much as we like with these different techniques, but at the end of the day, uh, we want to know what pragmatically we can use. We can turn to the randomized clinical trials for some guidance in terms of which occur first. So in the ocular hypertension treatment study and the European glaucoma prevention study, which endpoints did patients first reach when they developed a glaucoma? And you can see that there's like a, almost like a 50 for 50 split between these. Uh, and this seems to be the theme, the recurring theme uh, uh, in this topic. If we look at the collaborative normal tension glaucoma and the EMGT, which were both randomized uh, studies on patients with manifest glaucoma who were randomized to treatment or no treatment, this data is rather sparse. And actually both of these studies were not ideal to answer these questions. Um, so which comes first? And there have been actually um, a whole litany of really terrible studies that have tried to uh, assess this question. And I am the first one to admit that uh, I have contributed to this uh, garbage in the literature. And this is a, a paper where we tried to show which of these uh, things comes first. So we looked at the HRT, which is an old technology, and we found that in a group of subjects, almost 70% of the individuals had progression with the HRT. And actually a smaller number had progression uh, with, with, with visual fields. So what we thought we would do is we would take those individuals who showed progression for both optics, this, this field, and then do this sort of analysis to see which came first in the individuals that had both. So the hypothesis is that if there was a negative difference, then the uh, perimetry changes came first. And if it was a positive difference, the structural changes came first. 
uh, and the hypothesis being, as you can see, SAP is more sensitive if the data distribution were on the left-hand side of the graph. Obviously, if they're in the middle, then they're equally sensitive. And if they're shifted over to the right, then the HRT showed progression first. So that was a hypothesis. This is what the data actually looked like. Uh, the data were all over the place, unfortunately, and we weren't able to show uh, what was going on. Let's just have a look in the schematic of structure and functional loss. So here you can see uh, on this axis where there's 0% ganglion cell loss and 100% ganglion cell loss on the bottom. And what we know is that uh, with normal aging, we lose some ganglion cells. But we know that in glaucoma, that rate of loss is accelerated, as I'm showing in that schematic over here. And what we think is that a functional test perhaps covers um, some aspect of that spectrum of ganglion cell loss, and that a functional test, structural test, the other way around, will cover another aspect of it. And that somewhere along um, the schema, that there is an overlap between these two techniques. Now let's just flip that around and let me just look at this in terms of progression. So if we look at a functional test, uh, we may say that progression is occurring uh, at all those different events, all those different steps. And these are progression events that the device is capable of measuring. And we can do the same for the structural test and find these progression events. But the key thing to remember is that these events are unrelated. Not only are they unrelated, they are statistical and not biological events. So there is no rationale for us to actually put these things together and say that one occurs before another. And it all also depends on a chronology and how you use each modality. So let's suppose that you start to see the patient at that point in time and you follow them, you are more likely to conclude that that patient showed a structural progression first when in fact they may have shown actually a functional progression much earlier on before you actually started seeing that patient. If you started to see the patient a little bit later on in the disease course, you may conclude that the patient actually had a, a functional progression before because you've actually missed all these other uh, progression events before. So really this is a, a very flawed game in the way that we try to assess which comes before the other. And the final thing is that we are measuring here with our clinical measures something which we think tells us about retinal ganglion cell loss. And I'm going to argue in the next slide that we are actually several orders of magnitude removed from what we really want to measure. I would strongly recommend this paper if you've not read it. This is about uh, a four years old, this paper in IOVS by Brad Fortune and his group. Uh, in, in Portland in Oregon. And they've conducted here probably the best experiment that you can conduct on the relationship between structural loss that we measure clinically uh, and what we actually measure biologically. So this is in a group of monkeys who had uh, unilateral glaucoma. They had a laser treatment done in the angle to elevate intraocular pressure and the fellow eye was left as a control eye. And what you can see here is a nerve fiber layer measurement. So they, did the nerve fiber layer measurement immediately before sacrificing the monkey. And they harvested the nerve and they counted every single axon in the orbital optic nerve. So this is actually the perfect correlation between what we can measure structurally, which is in the nerve fiber layer and in the rim, and what actually that represents as axonal count. The red dots are the glaucoma eyes and the blue dots are the fellow control eyes. But what is really astounding about this data is that for a given nerve fiber layer thickness here, which is about 100 microns, there is actually a twofold variation in the axon count, right? So in the best case scenario, we have actually a doubling of an error in our estimate of retinal ganglion cell loss. And in fact, even if you look at control animals here, there's about a 60% variation in the axon count for a given nerve fiber layer thickness. So this really tells us that these measurements that we make clinically are at best surrogate measurements of what we really want to measure, and that is the number of axons or the number of ganglion cells that are still remaining. So we must take these clinical measurements with a large pinch of salt. With the visual field, the data is actually quite shocking. This is a older data from Ron Harvard's group uh, this is a remarkable study in the sense that uh, Ron 
trained his monkeys to do perimetry. Uh, this actually sounds crazy, but these monkeys were trained to do very good perimetry. In fact, their reliability is much, much better than any humans. So they, it takes them three hours to do it, but that's okay. Uh, whenever they get a correct response, they get a squirt of apple juice. The, so the data are beautifully reliable. So Ron did exactly the same thing here, created unilateral glaucoma and got these monkeys to do perimetry. But what you see here is on the x-axis is ganglion cell loss versus sensitivity loss over here. And what you can see here is a dramatic variation in the number of ganglion cells for a given sensitivity value. And this is actually uh, basically spans the whole range uh, of ganglion cell loss. So both our structural measurements and our functional measurements are far removed from what we actually want to try to measure. There have been some attempts to actually integrate uh, structural and functional measurements, and this is done by what's called Bayesian uh, uh, methods. So you basically take uh, nerve fiber layer uh, measurements and convert them to visual field data in order to use a statistical technique to make the visual field estimate to be much more uh, reliable. And there have been other techniques where you can actually combine structural measurements and functional measurements to provide an estimate of ganglion cell loss based on uh, Ron Harwood's data. And I would argue that this uh, approach is probably not profitable. So imagine that we try to integrate these tests and I showed you a sort of Venn diagram like this before. If the structural test and the functional test identify the same individuals as progressing, then I would argue there's no point in doing both of them because you have complete information overlap and you have no information gain. If you have a situation like this where there is some overlap, you have actually moderate information gain. But in a situation like this where you have little or no overlap, you can be optimistic and say this is maximum information gain, or you can be a pessimist and say this all noise. And in fact, this data looks pretty similar to the empirical data that I showed you before. There's no getting away from it. Noise is a huge, huge element uh, in what we do in these measurements. And that, uh, to show you the uh, effect of combining this data, uh, this is what you see here in terms of retinal ganglion cell loss with this combined index. You can see many more patients actually progress compared to the OCT or visual field alone. Here you can see the visual field index and here is the OCT and the patient appears to be progressing with the visual field index. But the combined index here essentially doesn't tell you anything more than what the visual field itself did. So the effect of combining here isn't really that great. Here you can see that uh, the, functional, the functional measurement doesn't tell you anything. The structural measurement shows dramatic change, but by combining them, essentially, you're getting the same amount of information. I want to just finish off by, by, by just reviewing how frequently ophthalmologists actually follow glaucoma patients. This is very important. Uh, testing done at least once, two years after diagnosis with perimetry is done in only about 70% of individuals. So after diagnosis, uh, one test has been done in a period of two years. Uh, imaging is done actually less frequently in about 60% and photography much less, but this is the most sobering thing. And that is that two years after diagnosis, around 15% of individuals have no diagnostic testing done whatsoever. And in fact, what's happening is that these patients are simply being followed probably on the basis of intraocular pressure alone. And this has an impact on how accurate our measurements of progression are. If we follow patients reasonably uh, uh, frequently, then in this case where we have a rate of change of a third of a decibel per year, that actually tells us that we have a fairly precise rate of change that we can measure in this individual. And if you try to project this uh, in the patient's lifetime, you can see that we can pre predict quite well whether the patient is going to get into trouble. But if we do less frequent visual fields here, you can see how imprecise our estimates get. And in fact, we don't know how well to prognosticate in this case. So I want to conclude by telling you that progression rates are highly variable among patients and actually estimating a patient's rate of change requires real data. Our modeling data is not good enough yet. The quality of the data is extremely important and you need to tell your patients and staff that this is very, very key. There's no point in doing a test if the patient is not going to give you uh, useful information. Structural and functional data will frequently give different results, but I wouldn't worry too much about that at all, because at the end of the day, I believe that the goodness of one test over the other is relatively minor compared to the frequency 
and the quality of either the functional or the structural data. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions from the panel? So I have a question here. So um, you're suggesting to get the good quality data. It's probably a good idea to be following these patients early on at least every six months. Are you suggesting every four months? And are you suggesting OCT with every visual field or some sort of imaging with every field? So, okay, so uh, thank you for that question, Lisa. I, I actually um, didn't have time to go into the frequency of, of testing. I would argue that if you have limited resources, which is the case in most jurisdictions, uh, it makes much more sense to do one modality of testing as opposed to mixing and matching. So for example, there's very little sense in doing an OCT and then when the patient next time comes in, you do a visual field and then you keep swapping and doing things like that. It makes much more sense to actually have the same modality of testing um, so, because that's gonna give you a more precise rate of change. It's gonna give you a better quality data in terms of how well you can predict what the patient is doing. The merit of one technique over the other, I don't think the data is there yet to tell us that OCT is 10 times better than visual fields to do it, right? So my advice would be, to do what you use to make clinical decisions, do it more often and do it with high quality. Okay. Um, Bal, I have a couple of quick, quick questions, if you don't mind. Um, first off, do you feel that the monkey data on the number of axons relative to thickness of the RNFL is it can be extrapolated to humans? And then secondly, uh, on a slightly unrelated topic, uh, have you, as a perimetry guy, do you have any experience with the virtual reality perimeters, the headsets, relative to a standard Humphrey visual field? So to your first question, um, you know, Bryce, in terms of experimental models, that's as good as it gets. Uh, you know, a, a non-human primate model of glaucoma is, is the best thing that we're going to get. There, there, there have been attempts to actually correlate visual field measurements with uh, axonal counts in post-mortem tissue, but we don't know the time lapse between the time the perimetry was done and when the tissue was obtained. So anything could have happened in that time period. So the experiment itself that I described is beautiful. Now, you can argue and say that maybe there's swelling in some of these monkeys because of the uh, highly elevated intraocular pressure, that's possible. So the data could, could, be, um, uh, could have some of that artifact. And, and that, that's, that's for sure, you can, we have to acknowledge that. But I think it's a very good experiment and it certainly shows the variation, uh, first of all, in the basal levels of axonal counts, even in the control animals. Like if you, can, if you say that you've created uh, um, edema, for example, in the experimental animals, the control animals are still okay. There's a variation in the control animals too. So that, I think the data is extremely valuable. Uh, with regard to the VR, uh, I think this is a, an exploding field. I think that already on the market, we've got so many devices. Uh, and I think that within the next five years or so, we're going to have these devices proliferate the marketplace. They will have AI algorithms built into them as well, um, so that we'll be able to do a lot of home monitoring as well. So I think that's a great, great development. But uh, as of yet, uh, they are expensive, uh, but, but I think they will only get cheaper and more available. Thank you. Maybe just one quick question from the audience. Um, sure. That um, is it reasonable to pick the test modality according to the stage of the disease? That's a great question, uh, whoever asked that question. So, you know, the, our, our, um, what we've been led to believe is that the structural test is sensitive earlier on in the disease, and as the disease progresses, we need to resort to visual fields. Uh, the scientific data hasn't really proven that at all. Uh, I think it's our sort of clinical gut reaction that that's what happens, but actually studies have tried to prove that hypothesis and that's not the case. Again, my, my bottom line would be, um, you, you have to do the test that you have the most faith in. You, you, I think all clinicians have a bias as to which they prefer to use and which they actually make clinical decisions with. Uh, there's no question that some patients will not be able to do perimetry. A small percentage of patients will never be able to do perimetry. So it's a waste of time trying to do perimetry on them. You may as well move on and use your time and do something else. And by the same token, some patients may not be able to do an imaging test. So you have to move on and do something else. You have to do what you have faith in and what the patient does best. 
and just do it as frequently as you can. All right. Well, thanks so much. That was a really fantastic talk. Talk. And so uh, I'd like to introduce the next speaker now, and that is Herman Stubita from Dalhousie University. Um, it says that I can't start the video because uh, the host uh, has stopped it. There we go. Can you guys uh, hear me? Yep. yep. Yeah. It... Try your camera now. Uh, still has the same uh, error. You cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Okay. Okay. So um, today I will uh, present to you a study that compares five visual field criteria for the detection of glaucomatous visual field damage. And uh, this is a bit of a change uh, between Dr. Shahan's talk where he talked about progression uh, study of, uh, of glaucoma, whereas I will be talking about what, how the criteria detect uh, glaucoma from a single visual field. Um, I have nothing to disclose. Um, here's a typical stat pack printout. It has all the essential mappings and parameters for the detection of glaucoma. The data in the printout is the basis for further classification systems, and many have been published, but for this study, we focused on the five of the most prominent criteria. The glaucoma hemifield test and the hot up anderson parish criteria are the oldest and have been used in clinical diagnosis and progression staging. FOSTER is a criteria described for prevalence surveys. United Kingdom glaucoma treatment study and low pressure glaucoma treatment study criteria have been used in large scale trials for patient inclusion. From here on out, I'll refer to the criteria based on their acronyms. Um, I would like to briefly describe these criteria for you using the visual field printout. All five criteria have positive, a positive result in this specific field. So the GHT focuses on uh, five sectors in the superior field and compares them to their mirror images in the inferior field. Here I'm highlighting a um, specific sector where there's a difference. Um, the HAP2 criteria includes the outcome of GHT, also takes in the PSD and looks at point clusters on the pattern deviation plot. FOSTER includes the outcome of GHT and looks at point clusters on the pattern deviation plot. LOGITS looks at point clusters on the total deviation map. And UKGTS also looks at point clusters on the total deviation map and also looks at the nasal horizontal. Um, the key message here is that the criteria are defined in different ways, but the relative diagnostic performances have not been compared. So the objective of this study was to compare the positive rates of the five criteria. We compared them uh, along different levels of structural disease severity. And we were also able to infer relative sensitivities and specificities of the criteria. To define structural damage, we measured the thicknesses of three tissue layers. The macular ganglion cell layer, the optic nerve minimum rim, and the peripapillary retinal nerve fiber layer. The thicknesses were measured in six sectors, and a thickness of less than 1% on the population uh, curve was considered abnormal. So we then created a structural damage score that counted how many sectors were abnormal. If a tissue was abnormal in one of the sectors, it would receive a point up to a maximum of two points per tissue. So for example, if all three tissues had two or more sectors with low thicknesses, then each tissue would receive two points and the sum of these would be six. And using this scoring system, we defined four levels of damage, six points being highest structural damage and zero being lowest. We retrospectively acquired 1,230 patients that had visual field and OCT exams done within four months of each other. These patients 
uh, had only glaucoma and other pathologies were excluded. We only included one eye in field per patient and selected for high data quality and reliability. Uh, sorry, not all of these patients had glaucoma. Um, so um, to represent the data, um, we used an area proportional Venn diagram and a dot plot. Uh, the Venn diagram shows overlap of the five criteria and the dot plot shows the individual positive rates. In this example, we have uh, a low damage group and we would expect low positive rates. Um, I've clicked a little too far here, but uh, in the, let me just restart this slide for a sec here. Um, so we would expect low positive rates in this specific graph because we have the lowest damage level here. Uh, however, HAP2 shows a, quite a high positive rate followed by UKGTS and then GHT and Foster, which overlap almost identically. And then Logitz has the lowest positive rate. And you can also get some idea of what the overlap is between the five criteria. And in a similar manner, we can examine the positive rates at levels of increasing structural damage. So as damage increases and we go from score 0 to 6, uh, you can see that the positive rates of each criteria increase and so does the overlap. UKGTS and HAP2 seem to have consistently higher rates versus uh, Logitz has the lowest rate and GHT and Foster have intermediate rates. From this uh, graph, we were able to infer specificity. Um, this group had no, this leftmost group, which has the lowest damage, uh, if we use it as a proxy for absence of glaucoma, the criteria positive rates are analogous to false positive rates. And the false positive rates then give us an idea of specificity. We can therefore say Logitz has a high relative specificity, whereas HAP2 and UKGTS have low relative specificities. And in a similar manner, we inferred sensitivity from the higher damage groups. These patients had some structural damage and can be considered as proxies for the presence of glaucoma. Here, HAP2 and UKGTS had highest relative sensitivities while Logitz had the lowest sensitivity. Um, so to summarize the results, the criteria, the criteria had inverse relationships between specificity and sensitivity. Um, GHT, Foster, and Logitz seem to have higher specificities and lower sensitivities, whereas HAP2 and UKGTS had lower specificities and higher sensitivities. Our results highlight that there is a lack of criteria with a uniformly superior diagnostic performance compared to others. Therefore, selection of criteria for study design would depend on the need for better sensitivity or specificity. Uh, apologies here. There we go. Um, and uh, so this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Herman. In the interest of time, we're going to move on to the next talk. So I'm pleased to introduce Yusuf Ahmed. And Yusuf is the recipient of the second prize for COS Awards of Excellence in Ophthalmic Research in the Papers category. So congratulations, Yusuf. And he is going to talk about the Toronto Portable Perimeter. All right, can everyone see my screen and see my face? We see your screen. Yep. Okay, awesome. So uh, my name is Yusuf Ahmed. I'm a medical student at the University of Toronto. And on behalf of our research team, I'm excited to be presenting our study, which is comparing the Toronto Portable Perimeter, which is a novel virtual reality perimetry device, to the Humphrey Field Analyzer. And this topic has already come up a couple of times. So uh, hopefully it's of interest to, to several of you. And I have no disclosures. So I think we can all appreciate the burden of disease that glaucoma carries in Canada and worldwide. So it's thought to affect over 400,000 Canadians and by the year 2040, possibly over 111 million people globally. 
The prompt and accurate diagnosis of glaucoma is essential and is associated with better treatment outcomes and reduced visual field decline. And in routine glaucoma patient uh, visits, patients often get an optic nerve head exam, ILP measurements, OCT imaging, and of course, visual field testing, which is often done using standard automated perimetry, which has become the gold standard for monitoring visual field progression. So what are some common perimeters we see in the clinic? Well, we see the Humphrey Field Analyzer, the compass and the octopus perimeters, but these aren't all perfect. They cost a ton of money. Um, patients often complain of MS care related discomfort when using these machines. And because a technician is required to operate these machines, patients have to travel to the clinic, which means in Northern and rural communities, they have to travel pretty far distances a lot of the time. So this is where the advent of portable virtual reality perimeters comes into play. So the Toronto Portable Perimeter is a novel virtual reality perimetry device that was developed by the UFT Eye and Motion Labs, and it consists of three pieces. It consists of a virtual reality headset, a wireless clicker, and a smartphone. And the smartphone comes pre-downloaded with an application that allows the user to run a visual field test on it, for example, a 24-2 test. And on the right side of the, of the slide here, you can see a representative TBP visual field and grayscale plot that looks similar to that of an HFA printout. So in this multi-center perspective cohort analysis, uh, we, we recruited patients with suspected or confirmed glaucoma, and the objective was to compare the performance of the TBP to that of the HFA for visual field testing. So patients all underwent visual field testing using both the HFA and the TBP on the same eye in random order. And some of the primary outcomes we looked at were the mean difference and 95% limits of agreement for mean deviation, pattern standard deviation, visual field index, and test duration outcomes for results on the TBP and HFA on the same eye. So we had 150 eyes included in analysis and the mean patient age was 69 years old. And as you can see from the MD severity breakdown, the majority of patients included in the study had mild glaucoma, so about 76%. As far as the results go, so I'll get into the blonde Altman plots listed on the subsequent slides, but this table shows a summary of all the visual field outcomes. And looking specifically at the mean difference in MD, PSD, VFI, and test duration, you can see that for the total cohort, test results on the TBP and HFA for the same eye were not significantly different and were correlated strongly as indicated by the Pearson coefficients on the right side of the, the slide in the table. The only outputs that yielded significantly different results were the increased false negative percentage and decreased fixation loss percentage seen on the TPP compared to the HFA. And over the next few slides, I'll be focusing on the outcomes highlighted within the red boxes on the table. So we'll go into those a little further. Looking at the blonde Altman plot for mean deviation, you can see that the mean difference for MD between HFA and TPP tests on the same eye was 0.21 decibels. And while this mean difference is small, the 95% the lymphism agreement were a little large at minus 4.25 to 4.67 decibels. However, MD was pretty strongly correlated for both tests as demonstrated by the R value of 0.91. For PSD, it's more the same story. The limits of agreement were negative 3.72 to 3.47 decibels. And although PSD was correlated, it was not as strongly correlated as the MD result, but still respectable as the R value is 0.81. For VFI, the limits of agreement were negative 10.94 to 12.26%. And for test duration, the limits of agreement were negative 97.5 to 98.8 seconds. And VFI was strongly correlated for both modalities, but test duration was not. So how do we interpret the results of the study, specifically the limits of agreement for the visual field outcomes? On the right side of the slide, I've highlighted our bo I've boxed our study's limits of agreement for the test outcomes on the TBP and the HFA. And on the left, I've included here several past studies that have reported limits, limits of agreement for visual field outcomes comparing the HFA to other perimeters such as the compass and as well to itself. A 2017 study by Rao et al. It, it reported wider limits of agreement compared to our study and concluded that the compass and the HFA can't be used interchangeably because of the wide limits of agreement. A 2018 study reported wider limits of agreement compared to our study once again but narrower limits of agreement compared to the 2017 study. And this study by Fogagnolo concluded that the compass and the HFA were clinically equivalent. Studies in the field also tend to uh, compare the limits of agreement to the test-retest variability on the HFA. And the whole idea 
is that if the limits of agreement are similar to the test retest in the HFA, they're considered comparable to the HFA. And in the context of our study, the, uh, the limits of agreement we saw in the TVP compared to the HFA were a little wider than those from the test retest in the HFA, but narrower than the compass versus the HFA. And this compounded by the stronger correlation values we saw for the visual field outcomes on our study for the TPP versus HFA suggests that you know, the TPP has some potential and is possibly comparable to the HFA. We also administered a questionnaire to all patients after they completed visual field testing. And it's pretty clear that the overwhelming majority of patients prefer the TBP over the HFA for several reasons. Firstly, the TBP uh, was found easier to perform by patients. Patients also instruct, found the instructions easier to understand. The TBP provides prompts, audio prompts, um, on how to use the actual modality itself, just to give you some background on there. The TBP also was found to produce less anxiety and claustrophobia than the HFA. And an interesting question we asked patients was whether they would rather complete their visual field testing at home or in the clinic. And the overwhelming majority would prefer to complete the test at home. And the TPP allows for this to happen because of its portable nature and inexpensive nature and possibly has applications to home monitor of glaucoma. So this is one of the reasons we asked that question. Now just for some conclusions. So the TPP compares similarly to the HFA for visual field outcomes uh, like MD and VFI, but a little less for PSD and test duration as noted by the lower correlation coefficients. Patients strongly prefer the TPP over the HFA. Uh, they find it more comfortable. The test instructions easier to understand. And in situations where common perimeters are not able to be used um, or unsuitable for patients, for example, a patient with neck pain who can't place their head on the chin rest in the, in the Humphrey, the TBP may offer a viable alternative. We do feel that more collection of data is necessary, especially in the advanced glaucoma subgroup. And we would like to complete a TBP test retest study to evaluate the precision of the device as well. And uh, I think earlier uh, in the session, it was mentioned that in times such as COVID, you want patients to come at the clinic as least as possible. So the TPP also has applications there. So it's an exciting time. Uh, virtual reality perimetry has, has really blown up and, and it, it's exciting to see where it's gonna lead in the future. So uh, thank you very much. Um, here are my references and we're always looking for collaborators. So if anyone's interested in, in possibly incorporating the TPP in their clinic to collect more data, my email is on the screen. So feel free to take that down. and. Thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you very much, Youssef. That's a very interesting talk. Our next speaker now will be Dr. Stephen Shendel, who will be talking about corneal hysteresis. Thank you so much, uh, Lisa. Are you hearing me okay on the other side there? Yeah, sounds great. Perfect. Well, maybe I'll take my poll question first, um, and then I can chat a little bit while the poll question comes up. But uh, I'm going to discuss uh, corneal hysteresis today. My name is uh, Steve Schenel. For those of you that don't know me, I work at, uh, in Vancouver at UBC. And this is really a topic uh, I've become more interested in because, you know, even as a glaucoma specialist, I've really only started thinking and, and learning about corneal hysteresis over the last couple of years. So please go ahead uh, and, uh, and uh, select uh, your level of comfort um, with uh, the risk of corneal hysteresis in, uh, in glaucoma. And then we can take a look. I think that'll give us some context for, uh, for the discussion today. So maybe we'll give it another few seconds. I just wanted to share this picture of what we should have been looking at all uh, in Vancouver, but uh, it's nice to see the, everybody's offices and, uh, and, and all the books behind them. So maybe that's it. We can take the questions. Uh, we, can, we can stop the polling and perhaps show the results. Yeah, so I think, you know, there's, there's a not insignificant uh, number of people who, who really don't have any familiarity with this topic and some that have a bit of comfort with it and very few that are, feel very confident with it. So I think it's a good one for us to discuss here. So we can close the poll results. Thank you very much. Uh, I do have some disclosures, but none of them are relevant for this particular talk. We've gone over our poll question uh, already. So uh, the overview uh, for today, we'll talk a little bit of what is corneal hysteresis? How are these measurements obtained? look briefly at the evidence for corneal hysteresis, uh, and then look at how it might be implemented in a, in a typical Canadian practice. So what is corneal hysteresis? Well, 
Uh, you know, really for a long time, it's been recognized that factors beyond intraocular pressure and uh, CCT are important corneal risk factors uh, for glaucoma development. And really, um, you know, one of the companies had uh, scientists working on developing an air jet tonometer to give a, a more accurate Goldman-like IOP. And it was noticed that there was uh, unique corneal information present in this signal and that this was valuable information for assessment of glaucoma. And as a result, Riker Technologies, who makes many tono pens and, and has a number of other devices, developed something called the Aura or Ocular Response Analyzer G3. And this is really the only device uh, available to assess corneal hysteresis. When we look at the cornea, we really think about physical characteristics like dimensions, like such as thickness. And then we have to look at behavior and biomechanics. And corneal hysteresis is really a biomechanical uh, behavior of the cornea. Initially, a lot of this work was done by corneal specialists who were looking at ectasias, uh, like things like keratoconus, post-lasic uh, ectasia, who, who did some of the groundbreaking work. Why might corneal hysteresis be important? Well, we know that corneal and scleral collagen fibers are, are continuous with one another and they're very similar. Um, so the, bio, the biomechanical characteristics of the cornea might have important information for the optic nerve head um, and the lamina around it. So when we talk about hysteresis, we're referring really to the, uh, the ability of the corneal tissue to absorb and dissipate energy uh, in a two-way applanation process. So we say this is a viscoelastic property of the cornea, uh, a shock absorbing property. And this is really what corneal hysteresis is discussing. And this is not a, a fixed measurement. This is a dynamic thing that can change over time. So how do we obtain these measurements? Well, on the right side of, of the presentation, you see the actual device. And what we do is we use a, an a eccentric infrared light and a, a something to, to capture that signal. It takes 20 milliseconds to do. Um, and then we use a non-contact uh, air stream tonometer to deliver that, uh, to deliver the air puff, as well as a pressure transducer. And so when the light is shone on the cornea, the light is scattered due to the curvature of the cornea and the air puff or air jet will flatten the cornea towards applanation and this will make the light collimated uh, on the detector and cause a signal peak to be noted. And at this point, the transducer will, will note the applanation pressure. Now the air jet then continues to deform the cornea, making it somewhat concave. The light scatters again and at that point, the air jet uh, slows down and the cornea then rebounds to its normal position and goes through another period of applanation where yet another signal peak is noted. And so this is a graph kind of indicating the, the pressure and the applanation signals. Now it might be intuitive to think that the in signal peak, so when the air jet is being delivered and the out when the air jet uh, releases would be the same, but they're not. And this difference is what we define as corneal hysteresis. And so it's, we've learned that uh, low corneal hysteresis uh, is really associated with glaucoma and progression of glaucoma. And what's the evidence for that? Well, first, perhaps some, some fundamental things to understand. Uh, corneal hysteresis is repeatable in individual eyes and strongly correlated in both eyes of the same person. Um, corneal hysteresis and CCT are moderately correlated in normal corneas, but they're not uh, completely uh, related to one another, but there's no significant relationship of hysteresis and other, uh, other measurements uh, of, of the cornea. It's important to also recognize that hysteresis is lower in patients with other corneal, purely corneal disorders like Fuchs and keratoconus. Now, Goldman applination and, and the aura uh, IOP Goldman measurements show good agreement of pressures under 30. So, uh, you know, this is a reliable method to both assess the intraocular pressure and assess corneal hysteresis. When we talk about measurements and normalize, um, we're looking at values between sort of 10 to 11 for an average uh, corneal hysteresis. And you'll see patients with glaucoma might have values lower than that, nine or eight or even lower. And we know that corneal hysteresis does not vary significantly throughout the day, but can with surgeries on the eyes or glaucoma therapies. So low corneal hysteresis has been associated with many forms uh, of glaucoma, open angle, angle closure, NTG, pseudoxfoliative glaucoma and congenital glaucoma, and some, some um, differing results with uh, asymmetric glaucomas, but I expect over time that might be ironed out. Additionally, low corneal hysteresis is associated with progression uh, of glaucoma. So if patients have a low baseline hysteresis, uh, they have a greater intraocular pressure reduction following therapy. And we know that hysteresis is also lower in eyes uh, with a higher pressure and normalizes after the pressure reduction uh, somewhat, but not to the same point as people without glaucoma. Uh, 
Now, uh, African American patients have a lower CH than than patients with than white patients or Hispanic patients, but this might also be somewhat confounded by CCT. So the the relationship here is less clear. How might we implement this uh, data in our practice? Well, I think it comes down to two things: office flow and reimbursement. Um, this is a, an example of somebody having hysteresis in my office. You can see the device is a large table-based device. It's not portable. Um, you know, the patient sits and rests their head on a headrest. Uh, it's non-contact, you know, so you can argue about the, the, the benefits of that. It's quite rapid. Um, and really, you would probably only, due to cost, have one of these in your office and probably a station that patients pass through, like an OCT. You get to, there's the device screen and a printout, and it provides what's called the corneal corrected intraocular pressure measurement. Uh, the corneal hysteresis itself, uh, an estimation of what the Goldman IOP would be in that case, uh, and a waveform or reliability marker. So in this device screen that I've shown you on the, the gray left data printout, you can see that um, the corneal corrected IOP is felt to be 14.9 because the hysteresis is slightly above normal, which means you would probably get a higher uh, Goldman pressure, but perhaps in fact the pressure is a little bit lower. So where do I think you know, this fits in our practice? I think it's very useful for baseline glaucoma assessment, for normal tension glaucoma and progression at low IOP, uh, unilateral progressors, uh, and also a more accurate IOP measurement after uh, LASIK surgery, not so much for the corneal hysteresis, which we know won't be accurate, but rather for uh, the corneal corrected IOP. And how do you get reimbursed for this? Well, in the, in the U.S., they have an $18 fee code with Medicare, but there's no province or territory that I'm aware of that has a, a fee for hysteresis. The device is about $20,000, so it's a significant investment, you know, if you're just able to recoup IOP billing. So how do you pay for the device? And there's different thoughts about that, uh, perhaps, you know, private pay or things like that, but that's not really clear in Canada. So I know I've moved quickly, but there's you know, quite a bit to cover. And I think it's a real uh, exciting area and a growing area. And hopefully we'll have more to learn uh, as we go ahead and share at future meetings. Thank you. Thank you very much. So in the interest of time, we are going to save all the questions till the end. So uh, thanks again, Dr. Schendel. And our next speaker is Dr. David Matthew from the University of Toronto. And um, he will be talking about aqueous humor profile in glaucoma patients. Thank you for the opportunity to present our work here. Um, I have no financial disclosures uh, to declare. Maybe we can have the first poll question now. Right, so identify the false statement. IOP lowering is a proven method to treat glaucoma. <clears throat> there are non IOP dependent measures to cure glaucoma. Glaucomatous nerve damage is largely irreversible. And the last option I can assure you is uh, not the answer. Glaucoma is the most happening subspecialty in ophthalmology. So maybe we can have the results now. All right, yeah, that's right. So let me introduce uh, to you what lipoxins are. These are small lipid mediators. Uh, these molecules are uh, small as well as extremely uh, potent, and uh, they are involved in inflammation resolution, and they have pro-solving properties. Um, in our lab, we uh, found that uh, there's in vitro and in vivo evidence of lipoxins A4 and B4 being neuroprotective in inner retinal injury. And in these models with inner retinal injury, we found that supplementation of uh, these molecules conferred neuroprotection. However, these molecules have not been studied in the context of clinical glaucoma. And that is what we plan to do. And we uh, decided to recruit patients and identify the aqueous humor lipidomic profile in patients with and without glaucoma. So this was a comparative study, prospective, um, and we took samples of aqueous humor from glaucoma patients and patients without glaucoma. Uh, these aqueous humor samples were sent for analysis using liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry. So briefly, a 30 gauge needle was used to collect the aqueous humor. 
This was mounted on a 1 milliliter syringe and approximately 100 microliters of aqueous humor was withdrawn from the eye. And this was performed before any other intraocular entry was, uh, was made. So this was at the start of the surgery. Glaucoma samples consisted of uh, 60 to 80 year old uh, patients who had primary open angle glaucoma. Control samples uh, consist of patients who did not have glaucoma or ocular inflammation like uveitis. They also did not have diabetes. Uh, these patients were scheduled for uh, routine uh, cataract surgery and they were all uncomplicated surgeries. Once the aqueous humor was collected, it was snap frozen on dry ice and stored at minus 80 degrees uh, till the final analysis. The final analysis consisted of a panel of 40 polyunsaturated fatty acids, metabolites, and lipid mediators. This study was conducted at two institutions, um, and both the institutions, REP, approved the study. All participating patients signed an informed consent form. We had 16 and 18 glaucoma and control samples, respectively. The age and the intraocular pressure did not have any significant difference uh, in terms of values. Uh, in the glaucoma population, uh, the average cup to disc ratio was 0.9, which indicates that uh, all the glaucoma participants had advanced disease. None of the control patients had cupping of more than 0.4. Um, the lipidomic circuit as such has uh, three major pathways, starting with uh, electronic acid, docosahexanoic acid, and aquasapentanoic acid. Um, the electronic acid, uh, which I'll refer to as AA, uh, leads to lipoxin A4 and B4 as uh, two of the end products. Resolvents are produced as a result of the DHA and EPA pathways. We looked at the starting substrates of these three major pathways and we found that only electronic acid had a significant difference between the glaucoma and control population. Even though in the DHA and EPA groups, uh, the glaucoma population had, had higher levels of uh, DHA and EPA, uh, the difference between the glaucoma and control sa samples were not uh, significant. So as I mentioned before, electronic acid leads to LXA4 and B4 through uh, 15 and 5 lab oxygenase enzymes. And we found that uh, out of 40 uh, molecules that we tested for, only the lipoxin pathway starting from electronic acid stood out. So lipoxin A4 levels were significantly different between the glaucoma and control population. So I'm not going to uh, bog you down with the numbers, but overall uh, the pathway that stood out was the electronic acid to lipoxin pathway, which we found was uh, quite interesting. So given the generally protective effects of lipoxins, uh, they are, uh, as I mentioned before, they are involved in inflammation resolution. They have a pro-solving uh, effect. And uh, the fact that the lipoxins are found in elevated levels in glaucoma samples was something that we found very intriguing. Um, but we also um, considered the fact that all patients, all glaucoma patients were using eye drops or glaucoma and all of them were on prostaglandin analogs. If you look at this pathway here, electronic acid leads to uh, the formation of prostaglandins as well as uh, leukotrienes and lipoxins through parallel pathways. And these are uh, catalyzed by cyclooxygenase and 5-lipoxygenase and then followed by 15-lipoxygenase. So these are parallel pathways and uh, the use of prostaglandin analogs may have an effect on the lipid, uh, lipidomic pathway uh, involving lipoxins. Uh, so in conclusion, we uh, evaluated the lipidomic profile of uh, patients with and without glaucoma. We collected the aqueous humor for that purpose. We found that there were increased levels of lip lipid mediators in the glaucoma at size. Electronic acid metabolites may be modulated in response to anti-glaucoma drops, specifically prostaglandin analogs, and this is something that we are actively trying to answer through in vitro studies. Lipoxins may have a role in glaucoma pathogenesis given the difference between the glaucoma and control subgroups. Um, I thank you for your time and attention. Uh, maybe we can have the second uh, polling question now.
So I next like to invite uh, Dr. Daisy Liu, who will be talking to us about iridociliary cysts. Thank you for the introduction. My name is Daisy Liu. I am a member of the graduating class of 2020 from Queen's University. And I'm excited to be starting my residency in ophthalmology in Edmonton next week. So I'll be speaking about our evaluation of the characteristics of erotociliary cysts at a Canadian tertiary care center using UBM or ultrasound biomicroscopy. I have no financial disclosures. So erotociliary cysts can be primary or secondary in nature. Primary erotociliary cysts are often asymptomatic. They're first found clinically on a routine slit lamp examination and can feature bowing forward of the iris, narrowing of the angle and iris configuration. Secondary cysts can be more problematic and cause decreased vision, painful red eye, photophobia, amblyopia, and progressively enlarge. They can have complications such as increased IOP, signs of uveitis, and corneal edema. There's currently very limited information regarding the incidence and progression of iris cysts. The most comprehensive study currently is Shields et al, 2012, but that has limited information as well. And finally, UVM is the best technique to distinguish iris cysts from iris tumors, which I will elaborate on a little bit later. The objective of this study was to evaluate the incidence and describe the characteristics of erotociliary cysts presenting to a Canadian tertiary care center using UVM. Typically, iris cysts are first found on SILAP exam, but they are not properly assessed. So we often use anterior segment OCT and UVM to evaluate and diagnose iris cysts. UVM, however, is considered the superior method of imaging um, for iris, sub-iris, angle, and ciliary body abnormalities. And that's because these structures pose a challenge for anterior segment OCT due to light attenuation caused by the iris pigment epithelium. So on the right-hand side here, you can see two images. The top image shows um, an iris cyst found on UBM, and the bottom image shows what appears to be a multi-cystic and multi-loculated iris cyst. This is an image taken from Ophthalmology 2011, which shows the difference between images taken with an anterior segment OCT versus UVM. They're images of the same iris lesions, as you can see from the column in the middle. But on the left-hand side, um, the anterior segment OCT image has a difficult time delineating the location, size, and parameters of the iris lesion. Whereas on the right-hand side, you can clearly see the margins are well delineated and you can see the size and location very well using UVM. The technique involves fluid immersion of the eye to view the anterior segment, and we take cross-sectional views that are obtained at each clock hour for 360 degrees. And that's important because, as you can see here in these two images, the top one shows um, what appears to be a normal eye taken at 12 o'clock, um, and the same eye with the cross-sectional view at 10 o'clock shows an iris cyst there on the right. So this is what iris cysts typically look like. They're a thinly walled echo-negative um, lesion with iris elevation. All our patients were initially assessed by an ophthalmologist using a slit lamp and then with UVM. So we obtained the records of these patients retrospectively at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto for iris abnormalities between March 2016 and October 2019. These patients were either referred to rule out iris cyst or an incidental erotociliary cyst was diagnosed through UBM. We collected data for age, sex, type, laterality, size, location, and clock hours, additional features, and any annual follow-up changes. We found a total of 189 patients, or 212 eyes, that were seen between March 2016 and October 2019 through UBM. 157 of these eyes were referred to rule out iris cyst, and 55 eyes were found incidentally. Uh, they would have been initially referred as narrow angle or plateau iris, each accounting for about 40%, or uveitis glaucoma hyphema syndrome, or iris nevus versus melanoma. As you can see here, the bulk of these cysts were referred initially, but um, a pretty significant portion were found incidentally. Iris cysts are most often found in females age 21 to 30, as well as age 61 to, 70, or 61 to 70. And they're often found unilaterally in the temporal and inferior regions. 
84.4% involve only the iris pigment epithelium, while 10.8% involve only the ciliary body. The rest seem to involve um, a combination of the ciliary body, pars plana, and the iris. Of the 84% involving the iris pigment epithelium, about 54.7% were larger than one millimeter in diameter, 8% were multiloculated, and 11% were multicystic. A similar proportion uh, existed for the cysts involving just the ciliary body, but that accounted for only about 11%. The most important thing to note here is that none were associated with a solid tumor. And finally, of the 212 eyes, about 23 eyes received follow-up for at least one year after the initial assessment. This is where the bulk of our data lies within the one year mark. Most importantly, at one year, 73.9% shows no change in size. To conclude, iridociliary cysts were found most often in women aged 21 to 30 unilaterally in the temporal and inferior quadrants. Ultrasound biomicroscopy allows adequate visualization and diagnosis of erotociliary cysts, and erotociliary cysts tend to be stable and asymptomatic on annual presentation. These are my references. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Liu. And um, so our next speaker will be Dr. C Cindy Hutnick from the University of Western Ontario. And uh, then after that, hopefully we'll still have some time for discussion. So uh, keep up your questions for the end. So can everybody see my slides and hear me? Yes. Very good. Well, thank you, Lisa, and good afternoon, everybody. And thank you to the couple hundred people who are still online. Hopefully I'll make the next few minutes worth your stamina. We're going to be talking about patient reported outcomes, but really my secondary question to you today, and we perhaps will answer it, is should this matter to you? At the outset, I want to acknowledge a team of fantastic students who have contributed the original research component of this presentation. Anastasia Vinokurtseva is a peer mentor and supervisor, and we have a tremendous team of Mandy Y, Victoria Lung, and you've already heard from him today, Dr. Matt Quinn nothing relevant to declare. So let's get the acronyms out of the way. Patient reported outcome measures is what we refer to with PROMS and PREMS refer to patient reported experience measures. So given that our objectives are, my objective is hopefully to give you a working knowledge of what PREMS and PROMS are, to summarize what their current status is in ophthalmology and maybe to help all of us understand what role they may continue to play or increase in terms of our, of our evolving management paradigms. This first caught my attention at the American Glaucoma Society meeting last year when George Spaeth, who is seen here with myself and Paul Kaufman, went to the podium and at 88 years old passionately expressed how important this is. The other thing that caught my eye was the significant amount of money that the American government was putting into the initiative. So when we talk about a PROM, what we're referring to is an instrument or a tool, but what, what it really is is a survey. It's a survey by which patients can comment on the status of their health without any interpretation by the clinician. So what we are trying to do and, and get from the patient is how their disease and their interventions may be affecting their quality of life. PREMS to me are a little bit different. They're more of interest maybe to the administrative um, people in healthcare. But again, it's trying to capture how the patients feel about their, experiment, uh, their experience in the healthcare environment. So when we think about when we see a glaucoma patient, we, we take a history. We then do a number of measurements and we've heard an excellent um, symposium today about what these measurements are. We then try to come up with some medical decision making on what's best for that patient. At one of, end of the spectrum, there's the paternalistic approach where we tell the patient what we think should happen. But the trend is now evolving to make the patient center and foremost in that medical decision making. And not only are we being now encouraged not to think just about the eyeball, not just about the disease, but to think about the whole individual that that um, the disease and eyeball are affecting. 
If you um, look at the website of the CMPA, it's very clear that the um, health record is actually owned by the patient. And what's being talked about more and more is that the patient has every right to contribute and provide input. In fact, now what our duty is, is to show that we have captured those type of data from the patient and have incorporated them successfully into their health record. Now you may listen to this and say, well, that's not gonna affect me. Well, if any of you have ever hoped that we'd have public funding for minimally invasive glaucoma surgery, I think it's already affected you. So in, in this CATH review process that took place, if you look at the different spheres that were examined in the review, only 20% looked at how efficacious and how safe the various MIGS procedures were. But a whole 20% with equal weighting were the patient reported outcomes and experiences. Now at the time of the CATH review, there was only a single peer reviewed published paper on this topic in MIGS. Now, I'm sure it's not the only reason why the recommendation was no fund, but indeed it did contribute. In the province of Ontario, the government has put funding into developing these things called quality standards. You can go to the website and look at the different things that have, have been developed. And again, a whole 25% was developed on behalf of the patient so that the patient and their family will be um, kind of um, tuned up and, and told certainly what to ask you when they come and see you. So again, very important. So what Anastasia and her team did is they went in the literature and they tried to find what sort of tools or instruments are already available. Some of you may be familiar with these. And really what we wanted to find out, is there one currently available that we could all use and incorporate? So the methodology that the team has been using is known as COSMIN. It stands for Consensus-Based Standards for the Selection of Health Measurement Instruments. And um, they're coming um, very nicely. Um, the, the group is doing well. This paper should be ready to submit within the next month or so. Now, did we come up with an ideal tool? Hopefully we'll be able to answer that question, but perhaps inspired by the CATH review, I'm not sure, but Ike and Dominic have um, come up with their own tool known as the HUGS tool. And they've even gone on to validate this as recently as 2019. What I personally like about this tool is it's very simple. And indeed, we're going to be analyzing it within the COSMIN methodology. It may be the one that we all incorporate. So what about PROMS in your clinic? Well, what they represent is an objective way to capture subjective information about that communication between you and your patient. More and more health policymakers are going to be looking to them in terms of funding decisions. They're going to be more looked at in terms of system level quality improvement and organizational decision making. So this whole idea of shared decision making between you and your patient is really gaining a lot of momentum. But as most things that kind of get on the bandwagon, we have to have a little bit of caution. Back in 2012 and 2015, we published some work about what do patients really understand when we talk to them. So if you say you have a hemorrhage on your optic nerve, that's about a grade 10 level of, of literacy. What we found is that a third of the patients that, that entered into the study, and it was all comers, had marginal or inadequate literacy skills. And this was true whether it was in a tertiary care center or a community. In fact, the majority of the patients were functioning at a grade five level of health literacy. So take home message from all of this is that healthcare systems are more and more going to be focused on patient-centered care. More and more they're going to be look, looking for objective evidence in the health record that demonstrated that the patient had an input into the decision-making process of, in their management. And I think PROMS and PREMS and electronic PROMS are likely going to be part of our future perhaps whether we like it or not. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Cindy. That's uh, certainly a wonderful um, and, and very relevant topic nowadays. And I find it's particularly important when I do phone consults to my patients too. Um, so we have time for two questions, I think. Uh, is any, uh, does anyone have any question for Cindy on the panel? I know, Bao, you had a question uh, for, for Yusuf. Yes, I do. Uh, Yusuf, uh, thank you. Very nice talk. Uh, one of the things that uh, um, is very important when you look at uh, 
two devices, uh, in addition to looking at mean deviation, is whether there's agreement in the topography of the visual field defects, because of course, mean deviation is just going to give you an average of everything. So it's important to know whether the portable perimeter is actually picking up, you know, focal defects uh, that, the, that the Humphrey does. So have you had a chance to, to look at that yet, to look at the, uh, to see whether there's an agreement in the location of visual field defects that the two devices have picked up? Yeah, that's a great point. And I think with the next phase, when we're testing, expanding with the TBP, that's definitely something we'll look at. This was one of the first trials we did with the TBP. So I guess we wanted to focus more on the, the basic visual field outcomes, but definitely in terms of um, sensitivity as picking up a specific defect, you're, you're definitely right there in that the TPP must be able to pick up a focal defect comparable to that of an HFA. So um, definitely that's a great point and hopefully in a future study uh, that we'll be doing soon, we can look at that one. Toby, can, can I ask a question of David, David Matthew? Yes. David, did you look at what other systemic medications that the patients may have been on that could have confounded the results? And specifically, I'm interested if you looked at aspirin. Yeah, uh, so we excluded patients with uh, systemic uh, diseases. So they were not on um, any immunomodulatory treatment, but aspirin, um, there are some patients were on aspirin, so we could not control, control for aspirin. Yeah, and I think that's important because aspirin has that unique ability to acetylate the COX-2 enzyme and repurpose it to switch over from the cyclooxygenase pathway to the lipoxygenase pathway. So because of this, it could actually shunt the pathway to be um, less inflammatory, more pro-resolving. So I think aspirin in particular is one that that should be accounted for when doing these type of analyses between a control group and a group with glaucoma. All right, so thanks so much. We're gonna go on to evaluations now, uh, if we can bring them on. So yeah, while uh, everyone fills out the evaluation, just wanna give a big thanks to all the speakers and um, uh, all the panelists, uh, Cindy, Bryce, Lisa, and uh, particularly our keynote speaker, uh, Bell Chowhan, for joining us this year. It's certainly a great honor and pleasure to have uh, all of you here in Canada.